Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Sir Mignot, uh, for the warm introduction. So, so uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, for the, uh, is this on? Yes. Okay. okay. Thanks. So, the focus uh, so should face which, which side? Oh, okay, here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so our power is, can I step over a little bit? Okay, good, good. So, so the, the topic will be contextual and the bottom-up attention guided, but the focus is on the representation and the learning for large-scale visual uh, inferences. Then I'm going to focus more on the representation side, but we'll touch base on the computational and a lot, lots of applications. So the talk will be um, mostly three parts. One is the bottom-up attention guided or neuroscience kind of driven computer vision models or learning models for uh, weekly and unsupervised learning. And this is a particular thing I'm pushing in, in called the cascade models or auto context model. And we have a series of papers including one which will appear on ICML next month. And I'll, uh, talk about other related work in the aspects of big data, uh, various uh, human-computer interactions, subspace learning, medical informatics, multimodality fusion. So, so this is generally kind of unsupervised object discovery task where we're given a bunch of images and we know there are several objects in there, but they are having various sizes or lighting conditions. And we want to discover what are the objects are and how many clusters are, and how, how, uh, how many images are clustered into different uh, groups and, and we want to automatically learn their model. So there are many state of art uh, algorithms in most uh, machine learning and uh, computer vision and people try to do unsupervised learning and there's also famous um, Caltech, so-called Caltech 101 data set and some of the state, al 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 uh, state of art algorithms will have around or even approaching to 100%, 90% on those uh, data sets. But essentially if they have a bigger centered and if they would apply on these challenging data sets, they usually get uh, very low scores. So this means <coughs> the unsupervised, general unsupervised learning is a challenging task and um, it's, uh, it's very uh, interesting direction to go. So, so in terms of computational neuroscience, there are a lot of uh, bottom of attention based or so-called saliency uh, in, in, into our eye movements towards the, our attention, then, then what are the saliencies. So these are some of uh, fundamental tasks the computational neuroscientists would do if we would see these images. So the, the Yellow dots are called the so-called fixation points or attention points. And there are certain connections between these attention points to the objects. So these are some uh, recent papers about how our visual attentions are actually guided by the objects. So some people will say actually objects will actually improve our fixation points or focusing on the saliency and we can use the human gaze or the object to help us to, to guide our uh, prediction on the human gaze. So, so in the computer vision field there are recently a lot of algorithms into detecting the so-called objects or saliency. So, so there's some pixel-wise saliency, there are also window-based salinces. Different colors will represent different importance of the saliency, if you will. And these and also recently there are also people focus on so-called objectness. So instead of learning a generic object detector, they define a bunch of objects to measure how so-called objectivity, how likely a particular window contains a meaningful object or not. But these are some of the, the figures. This is uh, the red one is a colleague of mine at Microsoft Research Asia. Uh, they have ICCV paper. Uh, this is generic window based, not necessarily just on the objects, but we can see uh, a couple of inter interesting interpretations. One is, let's say, if we allow a little bit kind of a low precision, uh, but you see we can have a higher recall. This means we're going to extract some interesting windows. These windows may not, based on the saliency or so-called quote, quote, objectness, may, they may 
not contain 100% objects, but the interesting ones usually are salient ones. That's the general kind of conclusion. So from the computational neuroscience kind of perspective, we see that objects help us to get a better prediction on the saliency. But this is the other way around, trying to see whether the saliency can be used to help our, our, our <coughs> object detection. So, so that's the general conclusion. This means if you would use the algorithm to do objectiveness, you see the precision is really low. But whereas you can achieve relatively higher recall if we allow low uh, precision. So that's the general kind of observation we have. So, so this is uh, the, the, the ICCV paper to use the saliency to detect various of windows. You see, the, the red ones are so-called the saline ones. We can, we can rank their scores based on the windows. The yellow ones are by the algorithm, which are noted as the most salient window. But we can see the most salient ones may not necessarily correspond to the object, which are desired here. But the objects, more or less, are, correct, uh, or, are correctly contained within these pool of salient windows. So then, all we, so using their algorithm, we also extract some so-called the least salient, those non-salient windows. These are so-called the non-salient windows. So you see, non-salient windows mostly don't contain the objects. So that's the general setup. So and also was uh, considered as a smart idea for us to do in our last year's CVPR paper was we use a generic saliency algorithm and to turn in unsupervised learning out, where we're giving a bunch of images, we're not told where the objects are, what objects we're looking after, and we're trying to automatically learn the models to detect them and to cluster them. So we use saliency to extract out the things in and build a so-called weekly supervised learning scenario. So the motivation is like this. So, so uh, for the rest of the talk, all of those papers I highlight as in the yellow are papers from my group or, or, uh, from, uh, or with uh, collaborations from. Uh. So this is the idea. Suppose now we, our goal is to find the faces and to learn the face model. So we can use the saliency to detect some so-called saliency windows. And also we can use the saliency to detect some non saliency windows. So these will form our so-called positive back. Same thing here. And we create a different image patches. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, as you can stop me any moment. So, so the, then we create some positive back in which there are interesting ones included. But also there are negative backs there, they may not, may not necessarily be interesting at all. Our job is based on the problem setting. We turn unsupervised learning problem into a supervised learning where we also identify what is the common pattern from these things. In, here, in this case, these are the faces. So, and then we extend the idea to explore larger amount of data, which I'll touch base later, and to learn what are, the, to automatically discover these patterns and try to learn the meaningful objects or, or the fundamental representations. So this is more or less a, a multiple instance learning literature and we turn here, the particular thing we do is to we define a new multiple instance learning formulation. We turn an unsupervised learning into a weekly supervised learning. Also, some of the aspects I'll talk about will appear next month on ICML, uh, International Conference of Machine Learning. So, so, so we're also developing learning-based things. Uh, so on the very, uh, core learning side and also core, core computer vision side. So this is the general concept of multiple instance learning. So it's like if we're seeing these two diff uh, three different keys, where we're told each prof these are three professors at UCSD, uh, they each one holds a key, a common key, but we, we don't know which one it is. So our hope is, based on the particular formulation, we, can s we want to see what is the common pattern. <coughs> Here is the blue key, which all three of them share. So we want to automatically figure out what is the blue one which are shared by these people and to learn a model on top of it. So in terms of mathematical formulation, we create a back in which there are interesting things, or uh, maybe cluster of things here, but they are also negative patterns or instance if you will. And, and, these, and also we know there are negative backs in which the, the interesting things are not included. 
So given this kind of setting, our hope is to identify these different clusters, so models, if you will. And then we propose a discriminative EM, and we prove that there is a direct uh, connection between so-called discriminative EM with the mu boost, and you can derive an ex explicit formulation to do that. So this is a more theoretical side, but I'll skip but Nevertheless, you actually, based on the back, you can, divide, decide, uh, you can define two cost functions. One is based on the positive back, and another one is based on the negative back. The particular ownership of these patterns is a latent variable, which needs to be integrated out. And you, you, can, you, can, you can actually easily derive this thing and perform the learning. So these are the, uh, I'll skip uh, the details of the algorithm, but just give you some of the illustrations. So, so in this particular, this is a so-called serial data set, which has been widely used in machine learning. And, and they try to perform the clustering, but not necessarily detection, so uh, under the uh, multiple weekly supervised learning scenario. So there are around the five categories of objects, and, and these are the windows detected by our algorithm automatically in the learning phase. So then we also, uh, beyond this data set, we just type in, we go to Google, we type in the monkey. So these are the images we extracted, and then we learn automatically. So these are the patterns automatically learned or discovered. You see, we need, it's nowhere near to be perfect, but you see still makes a kind of a reasonable uh, detection or model learning. And same thing with the Pascal data set, and also you can learn the face of horses or here. So these are up to, so up to 2012, last year, these are the results reported on that particular data set, several data set, by the learning algorithm, the various of um, learning algorithm. So using saliency, which was we did first time, you see already boost the results a lot. They're about 100% improved. With a, another top layer, layer of a more a principled approach, we get a, another big improvement over here in terms of this unsupervised discovery task. So, said, how many objects are there? Five. Five objects. Five objects. Five objects. Yes. So, so first you do the silence. Yes. Unsupervised. Yes. And then for each silence you window. Yes. You, you then do this multiple instance Yes, we do multiple instance learning. But the traditional multiple instance learning only assumes one single cluster. So here, we push into clusters. So, so you need to max margin between the, the instance cluster and, and also the positive instance and the negative ones. So you do all these things simultaneously. So can this approach be applied to like Pascal kind of? Yes, we, we, that's already Pascal data. This is Pascal. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's already Pascal. So, so I'm just uh, not showing a lot of more details. So 20, they have 20 clusters. Yes, we show the state of art. Here, I, I don't want to show too many comparisons, but uh, we definitely uh, shows much better results than those, those people, the, the Flowery group using week, uh, weekly supervised learning on the objects, or they call the object names or a bunch of other words. Yes. Because of having multiple uh, clusters of objects. So, you, like when you're um, in the front of multiple instances learning algorithms, so you are not basically limiting, uh, limiting to one object like, at a time? Yes. So, so like, it patches the salient, it patches that you're forming the, from one class of the object. You already know that that particular object is happening in those, those images, right? No, I don't. You don't know. We don't so know. Like all those like five no. objects are like, combined. Together. Combined all together. We don't know anything. The only given number here is the, the number of classes. We say there are five. But other than that, well, we don't know anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. So I already pushed it to the Pascal, but I don't want to show too many comparisons. But so, so usually, so that's kind of, so throughout the talk, I'll actually do that. But that's the pretty much the thing I talk to my graduate students. So if we, we, we see the performance, something poor, if we push, if we do the right, in the right angle, we do the right thing. If you only do five or, or six percent of improvement, we probably do something hard, not right. Uh, if we're really doing the right thing, 
so probably the improvement is not just five or ten uh, percent, uh, or even sometimes ten percent. So, so this means once it gets right or running, it's so hard to make it not to work. Uh, so, so, so that's the insights which help us a lot. So then, uh, this year, we actually were inspired by the kind of notion. Let's say in, in terms of your Google, uh, you're, uh, you're typing the words building. So you see these are the images you're going to extract. We see a lot of high relevance of the, the images to the, these words we're typing. And also the large variations here. And there's a large amount of data in Google, Bing, Flickr, we can utilize. So that's in the CVPR paper, which will appear next month, is to utilize this idea, but to explore large amount of data. For instance, you're typing horse. So these are the images you're going to get. Oh, so I should apologize to, uh, to, to, uh, to Microsoft folks, because I mentioned too many Google names here, which I shouldn't. Right, so but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, so, so you see you're typing face, or so in the being, same thing. Here. So, so the idea is, here we define 700 words from uh, Wordpedia and quad about half a million images from any, uh, these uh, search engines. And these images are first are having high relevance to our, the words that we're typing, but also have a good quality. So in terms of we would do, do object automatic discovery detection, it would be very hard because it's not well defined. But we turn the course around try to learn a meaningful middle relevant representation to these, uh, to these different words. Trying to learn what is intrinsic to horse building, all these things. So we define about 700 words uh, and, and acquire half a million images. So then we start to do so. So these are the images we, we crawled. Uh, crawled. You see the building, flower, birds, sky, water. So, so then we use, let's say, the building image as a positive images, and the rest of the images as the negative ones, trying to automatically figure what are the intrinsic patterns to the buildings or the components. They have mixture model because if a building will have different components, so they may not necessarily uh, fall into the same cluster. So, so then we use pretty much uh, use this in a hierarchical way. So hierarchical way is pushed a little bit later, but the CVPR paper is more focused on the second layer. And then for each image, we create some positive bags. And then from the negative ones, we can create some negative bags. Then apply similarly to the learning algorithm we had before to generate. So, so, so now this means what they were given is a noisy input. Based on the noisy input, we want to figure out what is the intrinsic patterns. So these are the sailing sea windows. And also, we not only based on the sailing seas, we also use some uh, dense samples from the images as our, our instances. So this is the CV, uh, ICML paper. Uh, we'll, we're using so-called maximum margin multiple instance dictionary learning, try to learn these dictionaries under this weekly supervised learning, where the traditionally the dictionary learning has been pretty much unsupervised using k-means or supervised, let's say, uh, extreme, extremely random words. So we're here, each code called the middle level representation is a classifier. You can use SVM, whatever classifier, on multiple features. And these form your dictionary, but uh, in a weekly supervised learning way, because we don't, we're not giving any annotations. So you learn the dictionary separate for each class? Yes. And each class usually contains yeah. 7 to 10 classifiers, SVM. So in, the, in total, for those half a million images, we learn about 10,000. These so-called visual concepts, we call. So these are the, the patches we learned. And eventually, they're going to put it into the classifier, because these are the important. So, so in, for instance, these are the buildings and the flowers. So once you have the classifier, you can have some firing on the images. You see, so these are the automatic learn these uh, the segments. So, so how do you, I mean, so you are saying you start with images, then learn these concepts. Yes. Right? So these concepts are what they're just clusters. Cl uh, classifiers, just SVM classifiers, linear SVM classifiers on shift just these different no, features. But I mean, for those, then you have the data to learn those classifiers. Or? Yeah, we learn. We have all these half a million images to learn the classifiers. So, so those images are just. Uh, 
you know, like a horse, you left lots of the yes. for horse. Yes. But these low, um, these concepts are at lower level than horse. Yes, right? they are the patches. So, so those page, these concepts you are calling the clusters of patches. Patches. Each concept. Yes, each concept yeah. a cluster. And this unsupervised men are just it's a cluster. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. But it actually, it's a, it's a class of each each cluster corresponds to yeah, a, as a class of it. Class yeah, class of it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So these are the concepts. You can see the firing of these flowers, which if because there is water sky on the other categories, they automatically more or less filters out and focus on the flower per se. So so then if we would apply this, um, so now this is generic dictionary. We use um, various of uh, these scenes and uh, compare these object bank or these other algorithms, which mostly are supervised, which requires detailed human learning. learning uh, we achieve a um, uh, big improvement. Uh, but not as before, but, uh, but actually we're using the same dictionary, where most of the t tasks there, they train in particular on the data set and test on the data set. So, so these are some of the representations we, we use then for each image patch. You can build on hog, LBP, color histograms, and, and learn a, 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 uh, then learn a histogram and put it into a SPM kind of frame, spatial pyramid matching. Yes? Basically, you are trying to find some data-driven concepts from a particular class, right? Yes. So what is the advantage of what you're doing compared to other methods you use, for example, in neural networks to come up with some data-driven concepts? So, so yeah, that's a very good question. The neural networks has, uh, let's say, for instance, deep learning or convolutional neural networks. They have the whole thing into a picture, perform class classification, right? Here, their focus is to do the classification representation. And these things, although they can unravel what are the concepts learned in their framework, but their framework you, you, if you, you read the CIM uh, paper convolution, those, those, those um, patterns are very much like a blobby, a little bit like a, still uh, very much like a hard type or a Gabor type of info thing. Yeah, yes, yes. Here we are more going after semantics and also we explore these larger things utilizing the discriminative information with the, in, in a kind of in a, in integrated framework. I think the purpose is different. That's, you, you bring up a very good point where we indeed want to push this learning into hierarchical learning and eventually build up all things together. But I, my personal view is these kind of approaches are more transparent than, than the neural network type of thing, <coughs> where there, there, there is, is more like a black box. The yeah. reason is that because you start with silence and Silence gives us very good, uh, like to reduce our search space, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So are these like concepts you get these, uh, with those on these clusters, all of them are meaningful, semantically meaningful, or some of them really don't? I think uh, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually, my, my I view, I mm -hmm. went through all these. Most of the things are like this, but maybe sometimes are not uh, this, uh, that meaningful. But let's say if you with the building versus others, the buildings are pretty much uh, clearly uh, annotated out or automatically discover the boats. I would say most images are like that. They're not like apparent junk clusters. Not because we have, the, the good thing is all these Google and Bing images, the, the, once you type in Word, there are already, already a lot of work there to, to actually to, uh, do the first hand screening. These images are not junk images, so they are well organized. If we extend it to a larger categories, to let's say some other words, may, we may see some redundancy. Of the, but at least on these 700 words, we define the images are very consistent. Yeah. Yes? It seems like this, uh, implicitly assuming that like, uh, most of the images they just contain one, like the most important object, right? Uh, no. Uh, the building, all the images contain like, uh, mostly just one building. Uh, I'm saying is if you, some images have multiple objects, different objects inside. When you learn this kind of classified pattern, do you see, does that change your results? No, no, that's a, but that's a very good question. But answer is no. Why? Because, you see, when we pull in buildings, you can have multiple buildings. Because we create a back. This back is based on the patches. 
So, uh, yeah, 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 yes. There's multiple buildings. Yes. I'm talking about the one image contains both a horse. Yes, uh, yeah. So, so the, the reason why it is not is because when we, you, if you crop an image as a building, mm -hmm. if every building image has a horse, then my our algorithm cannot differentiate. But the thing is, not every building image has a horse. We're looking for what's common, where the horse is one horse appear one particular image, but all the rest of the building image don't have. It gets automatically filtered out based on the negative ones. So you treat it as an outlier. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So by the way, how much time I have? Totally about another thirty minutes. So oh, another thirty minutes. Okay, I should start uh, speed up then. So let me wait. No, 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 no. Th thanks. Yeah, these questions are very good. So, so I'll try to speed up a little bit. So, so then also you can uh, attach this to the so-called the in the computational neural science sense in the v1, v2, v4. These are the so-called primitive hypotheses by the. Uh, computational neuroscientists to see whether there is intrinsic patterns. So we, we try to build this connection, but there is no direct connection. Just want to fool people that we 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 are thinking about that direction. So then these are the, the algorithms we utilize on, on these natural images, and and on on these various of uh, data sets. So just using these common concepts we learned, and then. Uh, I think uh, this group here, UCF, is famous on video analysis. We, I don't have to show this, right? So you're all familiar with it. So we use this on, on a weekly supervised learning on various of data sets, including UCF uh, data sets. So these are the patterns. So, so essentially, they are 3D. So I didn't show this in 3D. Was, these are the patches automatically. Um, you see the climbing, uh, sit up, right? So, so these are the patches automatically learned or discovered as our, our, our dictionary, if you will. So under this framework, so these are the results we obtain. I think in, uh, compared with, so we, we try to pull out all the res, res, recent results from here. So like the, uh, I think constantly you're updating, right? So I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure whether it's really the still, I, I guess should it be at least uh, one of the best results so far on this data set. We're under this uh, very simple framework. Compared to like uh, the object bank type of thing uh, Jason Corso did, uh, because they, ha they are heavily supervised. And we don't need any supervision just using that data set to, to learn these intrinsic patterns. Uh, the results seem to be much better than theirs. And then, uh, so, so that was actually more a, uh, uh, we turned a problem unsupervised learning into a, uh, into a weekly supervised learning. So what about the space? So now suppose if we don't have the screen model, we use generative model, we have a so-called subspace. So, so the, the, the uh, actually simple change we did was we, for each image, now we don't create any so-called negative ones. We form a lot of positive ones. So these, each image patch will correspond to a vector. <coughs> forms into an X. But not every single patch is, or, or the image or vector is the ones we're after. So we, we define indicator Z, vector, uh, 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 Z uh, parameter. If it is indeed a, a face, we hope this Z is going to be fired up as a one. And then if we choose the right one, they're going to span a meaningful subspace A with the outlier. So now the unknowns, the X is the only known. The Z's, A, and E, these are the unknowns. So we're minimizing the whole total rank of A plus a robust noise E such that X di times the diagonal Z forms A to E. So here are the unknowns. So then this is non-convex. We relax this into a convex optimization. So it turns the rank of matrix A into a nuclear norm and, and the zero norm into L1 norm. And further relax the z function such that this now is a convex optimization with using exact augmented Lagrange multiplier to do this. So, so these are the results on the face detection. And if you would use a naive uh, EM type of thing, we compare also with the previous algorithm. Uh, it, sees, it shows much rob robustness towards the, the tolerance of the ratio of a sparse error. So, 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 so uh, the, the conclusion from this work, which we, we submitted to neural computations, uh, is under revision now, is 
if the patterns are indeed under its sparse or, or into a subspace sparse, it's better to formulate into a convex representation to do this. But the, in reality, many of the patterns are non-sparse at all, it's, or non-low rank. It's very hard to push them into a low rank. If the, if the signals are not really intrinsically low rank, then, then it's hard. But if they observe indeed some low rank behavior, then it's better to formulate everything into, into a uh, convex uh, optimization. Then you, we have the techniques, so at least especially the recent optimization literature has the concept. So that's the first kind of work. And uh, we, we try to utilize uh, the attention or saliency and turn on supervising to uh, weekly supervised learning problem and also we push for large scale images. Then, uh, so another work I recently pushed is so called a structure prediction where we see images, signals, and also the documents and they all come as in a vector and which falls into a higher dimensional space or social network, connect up the data or brain images. They all come as in a vector in a higher dimensional manifold or, or space where our prediction is on a particular pixel or patch or variable and, but we have to understand everything in a whole. Oh, in, in a whole. And these are some structure, standard structure prediction literature, hidden mark model, uh, support, a structure uh, support vector machine, CIF, grammar, and also a lot of uh, inference algorithms, belief propagation to do the inference. So then one thing we exercised was uh, the so-called context, which uh, uh, I later built a so-called auto context algorithm on. This is a particular sentence, uh, so like I'm ill. If we just look at this, we, we know it actually represents a lot of meanings. Where if you have the context, this is the suicide node uh, we're, we're going to talk about later. So, so there are a lot of kind of, um, uh, these people already committed suicide. Uh, so when you, he says year, it's not physically year, it's, it's just mentally year. So there are a lot of meanings. Same thing here, so anybody guess what it is? So people will say, often say it's, uh, it's a fingerprint at the first glance, right? So when the contacts are revealed, then we gradually understand. Because all the prediction of either you feel called the patches or pixels are based on whole vector. Same thing here. So, so it says how important the contexts are. This is a, a symbolic view of uh, Brisbane River uh, in Australia. So, so the, the contextual model in the computational uh, neuroscience or literature also is very uh, rich, their li uh, rich literature over there, and also in the computer vision side, there are a lot of uh, context models. So, so in general, we people formulate the problem into a Bayesian framework, where the axes are the observations, y's are the predictions, can turn into a likelihood and the prior function. And overall, we want to do the estimation, but many times this is non-convex, so there are multiple local optimals, uh, and it's hard to compute. So, so we want to hear, you know, but this particular uh, work was trying to combine the, the modeling together with the computing part, trying to, to have a nice uh, integration of them. So now look at the problem <coughs> formulation. Suppose we're seeing this image, and axes are our observations, so then we turn into different patches, the Y's are our labels for each patch. So that's what in general in machine learning called a structural prediction. We can see a vector of input, a structural input, and we have a structure of output. But in natural, they, in naturally they form into some kind of um, uh, network and high dimensional uh, kind of connections. And the traditional way of doing this is MRF and the CIFs. But you see, the pieces, all the, space, the, the corresponding relationship, uh, the relation between sky clouds, you see a house with the cars, all these things all together. And overall, uh, you need to uh, do a lot of integration and inference over here. So what we did, or actually well, 2008, so what I did was trying to, to look at this from a different angle. So these are the problems with the existing models. So this is our uh, 2008, uh, the context algorithm I did. 
So suppose now you are giving these input images x. And these are the input y, output y. So each for each pixel, you would label each point as uh, foreground or background. So ideally, you want to learn a marginal distribution on the x with each individual pixel, which requires to integrate out minus i the rest of our pixels all together to get this. So this is seemingly a more uh, difficult problem. Where in a generic classification approach, if it's supervised, you can create a lot of patches. In case it's supervised, you know all these are the positives, right? You can create a lot of negatives, and you can try to define a classifier, which is a high dimensional space, to do this. But it's difficult, because for some patches, you see it's easy. But for these patches, just no way to can, can tell whether it's on a horse or, or on a grass or the background. So we need the shape, the context information. But the difficulty is that the generic definition of these things will lead a very high, compl high complexity algorithm. So, so what we did in two, uh, 2008 was actually to learn just generic patch based classification. And essentially, see these are the responses from the classification, which is nowhere near to be uh, perfect. But we actually, for each, each pixel, we should all allow many arrays. We use the importance or probabilities on these, on these sides. And together with the original features, we learn another layer. These are the selected features. So it tries to learn, based on the neighboring ones, where to suppress the probabilities here. Let's see, enhance the, the missing ones and to, to imp improve the results. So if you repeat the same thing, but you will select different features at different sites, then you see the results are get much enhanced. Like, like in the multi-class case, where if we only see it just this uh, carpet, the, the texture is not clear, so it's hard for us to differentiate from the carpet to the floor. But if we know the doors, which are easier to understand, this inference will help us to, uh, to guide us the better inference. And the problem with the traditional MRF or CIF is because the, if you define a shape or context, it tangle into each other into a very difficult formulation. Where here, it's a ca cascade of classifiers, uh, and then automatically learns the things which has a similarity to the, to the deep learning, all these things. But uh, luckily, we start almost uh, very much around the same time on these uh, uh, cascade models. So you, you, we, you learn features. And the bottom up feature is just raw features, where you can co go to 10,000, 20,000. And the contacts are about 10,000 context features. And, and they automatically select a subset of them. And these are some, uh, some just generic uh, input features, saved LBP color histograms. So, so actually, what we can do, is even in the first layer, we can put it into a uniform distribution if we don't know anything in natural images. So, what I'm saying is, starting from the classifier 1, we share the identical procedure. We don't need to differentiate between classifier 1 and classifier 2. We share the same procedure. And in natural images, it's kind of not informative. But in medical images, it's very informative because we can utilize so-called probabilistic atlas. Because we roughly know in our body the hard, blonde, where they are. We can utilize this thing as our prior information. Because let's say if we use the full body CT, if my heart goes to the right side, then I know probably either I'm an alien or I've messed up with my wife. Right? She works in open heart surgery room. So, so unless that thing happens. Otherwise, the, the organs are more or less there. So these are the priors we can utilize. But we automatically let the learning to, to figure this thing out. So these are the contexts. We, we obtain. So you see, so if we look at the boat, it looks for boat itself and also for water, road, you see trees, faces, body, sheep, and buildings. So, so these are the things automatically learned, but in a very kind of large pool of kind of candidates automatically rather than they are manually is defined. It numbers? Is it just a window? Or it is a windows and the probabilities, yes, windows, yeah. 
on the responses so because you have uh, multiple uh, classes of things <coughs> to look for. So then you can, conf uh, you can prove the convergence or skip. So in the end, the compared to the MRF, what we, so in the MRF usually looks for a small neighborhood because you have to integrate all the interactions out. We're here in outer context, we, we can afford to look for uh, both uh, local and the long range context and then you have stack them of them all together to form your Thing. And you don't have to do belief replication. In a way, you can think of it's learning belief replication in a closed form solution, um, which also has some analogy to uh, um, Trabla and Bill Freeman. They have what they call the, the 2006. They they have a uh, yes, but in a way there is some similarity. But this is I think more more general than than that. Yes, yeah, thanks. So then these are the algorithms you see. The horses get so computation kind of this is uh, like how it's compared to the so computation wise like last uh, so 2008 was about 40 seconds mm -hmm. but now we pushed almost we can push to almost real time so it's faster than the uh, yeah it's just uh, just uh, I think it probably just at uh, least one to two uh, order of magnitude faster oh, okay. yeah so if you would do traditional MI for probably least hours if we, uh, if we do a strict MRF. Yeah. I think it probably should be at least 100 or 1,000 times faster than MRF. And this is an interesting kind of thing. So, so this, if you would do generic segmentation, on um, these are the test images, you have done this. So I usually would call this either a failure or success. Failure because it carves this horse out. A success means actually all the horses are trained that way. So, so it actually is able to obtain in intrinsic shape of this one by carving out this, uh, the head of this small pony. And then it, it, we can push through the MS, MS, MSRC data and also Pascal data set. I'll, I'll skip that. And this is uh, actually at that time, I also was interested in human body. So I, I defined my so 14 body parts at that time. And, and you uh, quad about 200 Google images. And, and annotated myself. I spent two days to do that. So, so nowadays we can either use um, Google, uh, I'm sorry, Amazon Mechanical Turk, but and also I know how to abuse my graduate students. At that time, I didn't know. So, so, so now I won't do it myself. At least I can uh, abuse them to, to 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 do that. So, so, so these are the things. So, so then, uh, so this is the response on the test images: uh, first layer, second layer, and fourth layer. So, so at 2009, I, I gave this talk to uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge. At that time, I didn't know they were secretly developing this Kinect project. And, and, uh, and actually, if you would include, so they, they, the first uh, generation of Kinect, uh, they didn't use auto context, but the second generation, they start to put it. Not the, from the Cambridge people, and later from the Redmond, they start to. And because of, of the real time, the less constraints, all these things. The, the improvement is, uh, is pretty uh, drastic. So then we push to the, the brain images. Now it's 3D MRI images. And pretty much the same identical procedure, but different features. So this is the Grand Challenge competition at 2007 to, to do the hippocampus and the call data segmentation. So, 2000, uh, so I won the award, the first uh, prize, with this number, which is embarrassing, uh, on the previous hybrid model part. And all the contexts later uh, improved the number by also a big margin on the hippocampus. Uh, on the hippocampus. <coughs> then we perform large data uh, analysis on Alzheimer's disease. And these are the comparisons. And on 100 patients, now there are 1,500 patients. Uh, we show, this is the atrophy of, uh, of the prediction. We see consistent improvement. And this is the software now I put online for people to use to do full brain segmentation. So 58, 60 structures, you see the input. These are all test images. Various of kind of formulation and then the, by the different scanners, the algorithms are able to give a pretty decent results. Uh, no matter how, how variant they are, the, sometimes the pixel values are ranging from 0 to 100,000 or sometimes 1,000 to, to 10,000, so these are some kind of observations or connections. So, so one thing is, is abstraction. The knowledge abstraction is uh, very important. Now, uh, it's so easy for a graduate, graduate student to, to download SVM, random forest, these things, to, or even deep learning to learn. 
But the knowledge of abstraction seems to be important. And also the composition, different parts. And so, but how do we learn the parts? And how do we learn the composition is also important. And hierarchical models. And also computation. So the success of the other context is because of its nat natural integration of, um, of um, computation with the, learn uh, with, the, with the model learning altogether instead of uh, doing all the uh, brief propagations in the later stage. So, so nevertheless, so, so my kind of focus now is, uh, is the abstraction, composition, uh, computation, uh, and also kind of layer the models. It may or may not necessarily be true. So, so these are the some kind of uh, terms which are now, which were debates, but now kind of increasingly becoming diminishing uh, in machine learning, general model versus discriminative model, deep versus flat, explicit versus implicit, dense versus sparse. So, so and also there are a lot of also in competing uh, concepts, but I think in general, all these competing concepts, I, I think we'll probably should not spend too much time to argue, with, but actually they have different roles. As long as we understand their roles, uh, it seems to be in a harmonic situation. And then, so I'll talk about more, this is the, the work we're going to present next month on ICML, so it's, it's, which is extension to other contexts, but it provides another different interesting way, which I really like. Um, so the, the previous ones, like even the deep learning or, or the stacking or the deep layers. So, but we, we look for a problem from a different angle. So now, suppose in the other context, we learn a probability distribution, build a distribution on top of the previous one and learn a sequence model. So we have a fixed x, but this one is always changing. We gradually predict. So in a point, we can view this formulation as a fixed point solution, where the input is our output. <coughs> So, so if we, this is a fixed point, then we have the identical between input and a fixed and output, then we have a single layer rather than a stack of layers. So if that's the case, it has to satisfy the Banaha fixed point theory. It actually, is very simple. So the idea is like this. If the input and the output are the same, we start from any points A and B. They're going to have a projection. If their distance are smaller, then if we project them back, their distance becomes even smaller, so in the end, they're going to converge. This means no matter where we start from, we can always converge to the same point as a fixed point. Then we have a, uh, a flat model. Then we, you can prove that um, with certain construction, this is a strictly a contraction mapping with the learning. So, so if that's the case, then you can put some conditions, then change to change a deep layer into a flat layer by utilizing the, still utilizing the context. So this is a comparison with the structure SVM, all the maximum margin, mark of network, all these things. On this particular uh, OCR data set, this is a standard OCR data set, we achieve a significant improvement over there. These are the error rates. Let's see, we get ten, tenth of the error uh, versus the structure SVM, all these existing algorithms, where the fixed point model compared to the other context is just 100 times faster because we only learn a single model. Whereas before, we have to learn sequential model. We have to predict the, the classifiers in the previous round. So that's, I think, uh, I like the about uh, in terms of the generic formulation. So, so we provide a new way of looking at the layered models. Not necessarily deep, but it achieves uh, similar results and uh, gives a uh, significant uh, improvement under the, under the uh, performance uh, speed. And also two years ago, we uh, so our group actually attended the so-called uh, I2B2 competition for two texts. One is the uh, suicide notes analysis for the sentiment. And then the one is, um, is this co-reference to the um, medical document summary, uh, discharge summary. So because of the ambiguity, so, so we won the first and second prize. So they, they, I think internationally, there are about 50 groups attending uh, 20 or so from US. Uh, and the one actually, the one reason of reason we won the award is because of also we explore larger amount of internet data. We extract 20 million documents from the internet, from various wiki or other sources, to learn our dictionary to perform um, the prediction. And that's an, this is another project I led at Microsoft, which so for the uh, Kinect gesture recognition. So this is the input for the Kinect depth data. 
we perform the background. So this is standard uh, pipeline now. They, they perform the background removal and try to detect the, the joints <coughs> and put them into skeleton. Then there's a later skeleton correction stage. So then we utilize the, the, the inhomogeneous patterns of, um, of these uh, things and, and, and apply a, a, and also this is for tagging to, to, to give, assign a particular value to the gesture. Now we utilize the divine conqueror, random partition, subspace learning, ensemble learning all together. And, and, and because it's, it's a product, we have to, so we're given the budget to finish this thing within uh, two milli, uh, 0 0.2 milliseconds. So it has to be very fast. Where if you use the standard ones, uh, it's, it's not going to be that fast. So this is the pipeline. Uh, I'll skip. So these are the results. So the ground truths are the blue ones. The red ones are the input. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So me, I'm uh, so I uh, sorry. Uh, I think that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So anyway, it corrects the results, and w this was shipped into uh, into the Kinect project uh, last February. So particularly for golfing, soccer ball, these things. So but. If you happen to, to buy the Kinect and but still got frustrated with, with the golf, this gaming, don't blame me. Blame Microsoft. So, so you can send an email to them, not new to me. And also this, uh, this month, uh, we're still leading, um, I'm still uh, doing a confidential project at Microsoft to do the gesture recognition. That part is, has been shipped into the new generation so as well. So uh, the skeleton, all this you did in depth image, or you used the RGB? No, no, just depth image. Just okay. depth image. And also into the large uh, kind of data expect, so we, we collaborate with the professor at Zhejiang University on the various of cancer images of uh, these histopathology images. And same thing, these histopathology images are extremely large. Each single one is about terabyte data. Uh, it's, the size is 300,000 by 300,000. So it's extremely large images. And the, the pathologist will give us the notation that one particular image, these are all healthy ones, it may or may not contain the cancer. So, but detailed, detailed annotations are so hard for them. So then we utilize these uh, multiple instance learning, try to automatically discover the cancers and do the segmentation, image level classification, and the patch clustering all together. So, the, so these are the size of images. So here, uh, we have the cancer images and the non-cancer <coughs> images. Uh, same thing before, we create a positive and a negative bags and try to learn what are the different stages of the cancer patterns. So these are the automatic learned, the clusters of cancers. So these are the comparisons to, these are the human labeled by, we asked three of them to carefully label a few images for us to do the to do the benchmarking. So these are the results by our algorithm. So this was last year's CVPR paper and also a Mikai oral paper last year. And then we also do the manifold learning where we do, uh, so I'll probably check. So we do a manifold learning to do the unsupervised uh, metric um, uh, learning and the manifold learning. So the idea is to say, if you would measure the distance between this horse and the dog will be very small versus this horse and that horse. But if we have in, independent, uh, in, in between data actually, if we walk and compute a meaningful manifold distance, you're gonna, we're going to achieve a much, much better result. And here I think people also use diffusion map to do clustering, where we, def uh, we, de also, we develop a new learning algorithm uh, it's called as SSO and self-diffusion, which we show is just significant improvement over diffusion map. And uh, so, so we applied on to various of algorithms and uh, these are the, for, and also a push for the classification. We're on this Alzheimer's disease. We start from the bottom uh, input, the baselines from 39% and improve to 91%. So it's like improved 200 times, uh, 200 times, uh, relatively 200%. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, we collaborate with the one researchers at the University of Toronto in hospital to push um, um, for multimodality uh, disease. Uh, understanding or, or classification where we have the uh, we, are, we have the genetic data, we also have the image data, we also have the uh, the documented data. So we do multi-modality fusion, and we see uh, some uh, improvement. That was uh, uh, with submission to a Nature method, which I see will most likely be rejected. But for students, uh, for graduate <coughs> students, I think it's a good exercise. 
Uh, but I think uh, people in general, like we already sub -sub presented in the NIPS uh, various workshops, people in general like this uh, direction. Uh, so, so the opt-in is, I think, uh, the, the diffusion and the intrinsic manifold actually is very helpful if they really span a manifold diffusion. So, so I'll, I'll conclude. So pretty much um, the, the, the big data is an important thing, but big data is not just a buzzword. We should also not abuse big data. So it's always, if there's data there, we, we, we ought to utilize, but we... But we, just, we cannot just build a nearest neighborhood to utilize. We have to look for the intrinsic representation and the computation. And, and the data of interest are often higher dimensional, but has an intrinsic structure. The structural information is very useful. And the opposite, uh, abstraction, the composition, and the computation, and the computation, the local computation, always very helpful. I think overall, this is a, a very exciting moment to work on computation and machine learning. Also, you might be able to say, because of the cloud computing and, and the, the fundamental statistical models, and also a lot of other resources we have, this is the field of the division of human beings. Remember, back 35 years ago, I always like to say that. It's a really exciting moment, even uh, it's a, maybe a lifetime opportunity for us. We see thousands of applications. Um, the smartphones are using the various of Techniques, and we see, let's say, millions of cameras mounted in China. Um, I can share your stories. So last, I think, several months ago, I met with the chief cyber police officer in China. It was a serious crime here. So they uh, pulled out all the videos from all these uh, cameras, and, and uh, for that week, that particular city is running out of hard drive. Every, every station has to pull out and ask the policeman to go over the so one, I think one uh, fresh kind of junior policeman found the suspect. He did 10 seconds ago, and he got it promoted right away. Uh, but they, they have to actually solve the crime. Because of, and then now in China, 70 or 80 percent of the crime, these crimes are solved based on all these videos. And the, the schooling actually helped us a lot. If we were to do able to do tracking, we were to do all these uh, kind of first hand and a lot of screening. Uh, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity, but also we see the net market being utilized by millions of people in fact, the new generation of the rainbow, uh, as already is uh, and also we're working on another second generation after the rainbow, so that we, when we carry the cameras, we have to put rear wrappers on being in Microsoft, and now that people can see the cameras. So, so maybe they're just trying to do something. But nevertheless, so, so you know, it's very interesting. Uh, so all these things, see the big opportunities and challenges. All things are coming together, computing resources. The things are really, they're not making it real now. Uh, now <coughs> talk to ordinary people, they know what is the division of these things that can take us in smartphones. It's a tremendous opportunity. But the, uh, myself, I think the population is still one of the most important things. We should not abuse the technology, we should not abuse the data. Uh, we should still look for the fundamental things. Uh, but we see a lot of uh, rewards from doing this. Okay, uh, thank you so much.